Okay, I'm uh, Pastor Ron Tabor from Grace Bible Ministries, and we meet over at uh, 37th and Harrison, Big Blue House across from Weber State. Sunday night or Sunday afternoon at three is our Bible study, and then at four o'clock is our service. Usually go to about 5:30. So if you're ever in that area, and want to join us, feel free to come on in. Um, let's go ahead and go go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll uh, we're gonna start out in Isaiah chapter 53, and then we'll go from there. Isaiah 53, let's pray. Father, we are thankful for this evening. Thank you, God, for this place of refuge, Lord, where we can come and people can uh, be refreshed with cool air and food and, and provision, Lord. We're just thankful for those who labor and prepare these things and those who've contributed. What a wonderful testimony or example of grace, unmerited favor. I pray, Lord, now as we open the scriptures that you would... Um, Reveal Jesus Christ to our hearts anew. And Father, perhaps there's someone here tonight who's never placed their faith in Jesus Christ, and they might do that tonight. By the preaching of your word and for the glory of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So um, the Bible, this book, this Bible, the Bible is the word of God. This is it right here. If you want to understand the heart and the mind and the will of God, you open this book and you read. You don't have to go into a trance. You don't have to play with a Ouija board or uh, uh, cut a chicken open and lay their gizzards all over the place. You just open the book and read it. This book is the Word of God, and it's 66 books. 66 books written over a period of about 1,500 years. And this is one of the manifestations of this book is the Word of God is if you picture a puzzle, you, you bought a puzzle, and uh, it's a 66-piece puzzle. And uh, the pieces were, were carved by, by 40 different people, 40 different authors. And they didn't know each other, and they lived with, within a span of 1,500 years from each other. Some knew each other uh, in segments, but others didn't know them and throughout that time frame. And they carved out this puzzle, and every piece of that puzzle fit together into a picture of a person. And that person's face is Jesus Christ. That's what the Bible is. This book is the Word of God put together like no other book. It's not just one book. It's 66 books, 40 different authors, give or take, over about a period of 15 to 1,600 years. Okay? It's a supernatural book that fits together and shows us Jesus Christ. And tonight I want to kind of demonstrate that <clears throat> and, uh, and then talk about the significance of Jesus Christ to us individually and personally. So I thought the greatest place to begin for this, to show this mosaic, would be Isaiah chapter 53. The book of Isaiah was, was written approximately 700, 650 to 700 B.C. Um, one, of the, one of the major prophets of the scriptures. And uh, chapter 53 tells us of the suffering servant of Jehovah, the suffering servant of Jehovah. Now, I'm going to read through. It's, it's a short chapter. It's only 12 verses. I'm going to read through the whole thing, and then I'm going to, I'm going to kind of cherry pick key passages out and, uh, and talk about those, and then we're going to jump forward uh, to the writings of the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians, which is about maybe 2,000 years ago, written maybe uh, definitely before 70 A.D., so uh, definite time gap, and then here we are 2,000 years, give or take, later. So let's look at Isaiah 53, starting in verse 1 again, just 12 verses, and then we'll, we'll be on our way. So Isaiah writes, he says, Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord, arm of Jehovah, Yahweh, revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant. And as a root out of dry ground, he hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. 
All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. He made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit found in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquity. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death. He was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Now this passage of scripture <clears throat> is problematic for the Jewish people today for the rabbis and so forth, the teachers uh, of the law of Israel. Because they have rejected their Messiah, Jesus, and yet when they get to Isaiah 53, it screams Jesus Christ. And so some rabbis will skip over it entirely. Some will read through and try and say that the suffering servant here is Israel itself. But the reality is, this is a prophetic word from heaven written about 700 years before the birth of Jesus Christ. And it projected into the future seven centuries, the coming of the one who would die as an offering for the sin of mankind. So let's look at this and break it down and, 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 and make application. Speaking of this servant, it says, He shall grow up before him, before the Lord, as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. A root out of dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. He's not an attractive man. <clears throat> He's a plain looking man. And when we shall see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. You see, Hollywood is filled with uh, good looking people for the most part, right? Your Brad Pitts, your Angelina Jolie's, and whoever the star today at Chris Pratt. Uh, they're not on there because they have good speaking skills. They're on there because they look, look good for the camera. If they're a primary role, now they got you know they got old folks in there like me and stuff and older, but that, those are for, for special roles. But but Jesus Christ, there was nothing attractive to to look at. He wasn't a Brad Pitt. He was a normal guy. There was nothing wrong with him. It was just he was plain in his appearance, and it says uh, uh, he said that says that there was no beauty or comeliness that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected of men. The Bible says that Jesus Christ came unto his own and his own received him not. He came to the Jews who had been prepared and, and had anticipated and foretold the Messiah from the very beginning in Genesis chapter 3 all the way through the Old Testament scriptures was the, the, the signature mark of the, the prophetic word of the coming Messiah. And yet when he came, he was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. And, and it says, and we hid our faces, as it were, from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. We, had, we saw no value in him. You know, when Jesus Christ was, was uh, brought before Pontius Pilate and, and Pontius Pilate's trying to figure a way out of this po political conundrum, he says, hey, how about I release unto you, uh, uh, I release unto you Jesus uh, it's, it was the, the, uh, the Passover and it was tradition that he would release someone to the Jews as a token, a gesture to them. And uh, so he brought up Barabbas and Jesus. Barabbas was a murderous thief and Jesus the son of God, <laughs> the king of Israel. And when they cried, the people cried out, they wanted Barabbas. They wanted Barabbas to be released. So they esteemed Jesus not. They didn't value him as their Messiah. In fact, what did they think of him? They thought he was demon possessed and deserved to be crucified and murdered. Surely, though, he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken and smitten of God and afflicted. But listen to this in verse 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. 
He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement that brought us peace, or the chastisement of our peace, was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. This is a beautiful synopsis of the good news, the gospel message. That Jesus Christ was wounded not for his transgressions, but for ours. Now, transgression is when you go beyond the boundary. You've transgressed the law of God. And we've all broken the law of God. We're all sinners by default. That's who we are. The law of God was given not to make us good people, but to show us that we are guilty. We, are, we have fallen and we're guilty before God. We have transgressed. We've gone across his law. So he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement that brought us peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. You see, salvation comes not from keeping religious commandments and laws and rules. This is the worst kept secret in the world is that eternal life and going to heaven and salvation, having your sins removed and your conscience cleared, is not the product of going to a religious system. What do I mean by a religious system? I mean any system that says, if you do A, B, and C, then God will give you D, E, and F. But if you don't do A, B, and C, then God will withhold D, E, and F. You see, God brings gives salvation as a free gift. Amen. And how does he provide this, the riches of this wonderful gift? Well, he provides it through the sacrifice of his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ's body was broken, broken open as a sacrificial offering to the Father. And his blood was poured forth as the ransom price. His lifeblood was the precious ransom price to the Father that paid for all of our sins. Every single sin, little sins up to the biggest sins. Jesus Christ was wounded for our transgressions. Jesus Christ was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon Jesus Christ. And with the stripes of Jesus Christ, we are healed. You see, salvation is a free gift to guilty sinners. It's free you know the meal you're going to go in there and eat? Do they charge you for that? No. How about even one penny? They charge you a penny. No. You have to have a penny? Come on, surely they got to charge a penny. No. no. If they charged you a penny, would it be free? No. no, it would be one cent. You have to pay or you don't get it. Right. Well, guess what? Salvation is free. You don't pay for it because Jesus Christ has already paid on the cross of Calvary. He's already paid the price. Listen again to what Isaiah the prophet said. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. Now the problem is not the simplicity of the gospel. That's not the problem. The problem is the hardness of the human heart and pride. It says, I don't need that grace gift. I'm a good person. I can do it myself. I'm not, I'm not like those people that need that stuff. I'm good enough. I've got my religious system. I live by the golden rule or whatever rule you make up for yourself. The problem is that that will not cleanse you of your sin. You see, I go out, I go out and murder a family of six, right? I can murder a family of six and say, you know what? I think I'm going to make up for that. I'm going to join the Kiwanis Club. I'm going to go out and help the homeless. <laughs> I'm going to make up for it. And then you go to court. They finally catch you. They bring you to court. They, say, judge. They, they gavel down guilty. They say, judge, judge, one. Whoa, judge, one more thing here you don't know about. I'm a esteemed member of the Kiwanis Club. Hello. I feed the homeless. So just make it disappear. You see, that has no bearing on the murder that you've committed. But we think somehow I'm going to live sinful rebellion against God and I'm going to go out and rub some beads and that's going to make God happy. I'm a bead rubber. Oh, you do the beads? Oh, I do this other thing. I go down to the building down the street and I go up there. I pay a lot of money to get in. I go up to the top level and sit in a big fancy room and, and think happy thoughts. I baptize people. 
I've been baptized. I had my head dunked in water, came out of that water. And then they put a special cross around my neck. It was so mystical. Well, you know, the cross and baptism water, you know, that cannot cleanse away the sin of your heart. It's only by his stripes that you're going to be healed. And most people say, no, thank you, man. I don't want it. To quote Keith Green, you can keep all that junk to yourself. Are you about done yet? I want to go eat. And I'm offering you right now the gift of eternal life. Amen. I'm not offering you a, a trip to, to, to some religion. You don't have to see me ever again to receive eternal life. You don't have to put one dollar, one dime, or one penny in the coffers at our church to keep the lights on. All you need to do is to realize that Jesus Christ was wounded for our transgressions. Jesus Christ was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. You say, no, that's too easy. I'm good in my religion. I'm good. I'm good at the Kiwanis Club. I'm good there. I got a parking space now. Yeah, I murdered the family of six. What's your point? I got a parking space at Kiwanis Club, and I, they got my picture in the Hall of Fame there at the Kiwanis Club. I helped pour the foundation of the, you know, the, the, the shelter over there. I, I, I paid good money for that. Doesn't wipe away your sin. Doesn't absolve you of your guilt. But Jesus Christ became the sacrifice. The Bible says that he became sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So you see, it's all the work of Jesus Christ and none of us. This is really good news. And the problem is they say, oh, that's too good to be true. You mean all I got to do is believe on Jesus Christ and I'll have eternal life? Yep, that's what the word says. It's not my word, it's what the word of God says. Ah, that's, that's too easy. It's too easy. Well, let's keep continue here in Isaiah 53. All we like sheep have gone astray. Do you see that? All of us have. That includes me, includes everyone here, everyone in the kitchen, every person you'll meet outside, the Pope on TV, the prophet, the priest, the teacher, blah, blah, rabbi, guru, whoever it is. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. See, we don't even care. We don't even care. We don't care what the Ten Commandments are. We don't care. We don't care. I just care about my way. Satisfying me. Right? And so I'm going my way to satisfy me. And you're going your way to satisfy you. And oh, by the way, isn't that the essence of Satanism? Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. That is the essence of Satanism. You know, just a quick side here. I find it fascinating today that people are coming out of the closet admitting they worship Satan. I see more young people today with big Baphomet shirts and uh, Satanic shirts and Satanic markings and stuff. And I'm thinking, you do realize that Satan despises you. He hates you. He will take you into the lake of fire. That is what his objective is. And now why are you following a demon that will give you power, temporal power in this world so you can spend eternity in the lake of fire? When the Lamb of God did not come to put a yoke on your shoulder, but he bore the yoke of your sin and the wrath of God for your sin so you could have eternal life with him. Amen. How can you hate Jesus Christ and love the devil? This world's upside down, is it not? Can't serve two masters. Amen. All right, this world's upside down. A man doesn't know if he's a man anymore. A woman doesn't know what a woman is. You believe that? We live in a world today where a woman don't even know what a woman is. They've asked the Supreme Court. There's a justice on the Supreme Court doesn't know what a woman is. And we chose her to lead our country, make wise decisions. We're reprobate nation. We, we have no mind. A man cuts off his genitals and gets hormones. He calls himself a woman. We're twisted and sick and depraved. Folks, we need a savior that will save us. We can't. There's no religious system that can save that. There's no religious system that can save me. See, I'm not going to tell you all my sins. <laughs> I'll just tell you the, the ones that I can, you know. I won't tell you all my sins, though. But Jesus Christ knew him. And you know what he did? He bore my sins on the cross. 
The Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. It includes me. It includes the transgender, the homophobic, or the, and the homophobic and the homosexual, and, and the transgender and the Satan worshiper. Jesus Christ had the sins of all those people placed on him. And Jesus Christ was smitten of the Father for our sins and not his. Yes. And the Satanist, the blasphemer, can have those sins washed away white as snow. But he won't do it. You won't believe. You simply won't believe. That's why it doesn't uh, happen. People aren't saved for the most part. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet, yet he opened not his mouth. This is one of the great testimonies that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Because they beat him. Remember, they, they whipped him. First he was whipped by the Jews and they punched him and they put a bag on his head and they punched him in the head and they mocked him. Ha <laughs> ha, prophesy now. Who hit thee, they said. Oh, if you're the son of God, you know who just punched you in the face even though there's a bag on your head. And they hit him with sticks. And then they gave him to the Romans. And the Romans, they... Oh, the Romans did not play. They had the cat of nine tails. And they would hit you and whip you like a, like a whip saw. They had bones, in the, bones and stones in that whip. And they would hit the back of the Lord Jesus Christ and pull hit his back and pull. And what did the text say? He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Can you imagine the Son of God being beaten there and he's silent? I can imagine. Okay? Not, no cursing, no profanity, but silent as he's beaten mercilessly. The Bible says that his face was marred beyond recognition. Back, back in... Uh, Back in verse 52, verse 14. And as many were astonished at thee, his visage, his face, was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. When they were finished with him, whipping and beating him and nailing him to the cross, he was hamburger meat from the top of his head to the tips of his toes. And he was beaten, why? For our transgressions. And he remained silent. This is love, folks. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before his shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off. This is where he died. He was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people was he stricken. You see, Jesus Christ died on the cross as a sacrifice, as an offering to God. He was a, his body was an offering to God. It was the only offering that ever satisfied the wrath of God. All those temple sacrifices, they never satisfied his anger. In fact, every new sacrifice that was offered at the temple was a reminder that God didn't accept the last sacrifice. Because if he accepted the last one, why do I need another one? And another one, and another one for my sins. But Jesus Christ died once for all. On that cross, he was cut off out of the land of the living. That cross was an altar, a holy altar to God, where the perfect sacrifice of his son was offered. And that life ransom blood was, was payment to the father for the, wrath, for the wrath that was due us. He made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death because he had done no violence. Neither was there any uh, deceit found in his mouth. And uh, I believe it was uh, Joseph Arimathea gave is a wealthy man yielded up gave up his gravestone his his burial place to Jesus Christ. Back in the day, if you weren't wealthy, you were thrown in a heap. You didn't you didn't get a, a burial like that. This is a wealthy man's uh, tomb, family tomb. Listen to this. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He the Father hath put him the Son to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days. That speaks of resurrection. How does a man who cut off and died, how does his days get prolonged? It's by resurrection from the dead. The father shall prolong his days and the pleasure of Jehovah shall prosper in his hand. He, the father, shall see the travail of the son's soul and shall be satisfied. And this is what's important that we understand. Is that God is satisfied. His wrath is satiated or appeased by one thing only. And that is the travail of the soul of Jesus Christ. He is not satisfied with your religious deeds. 
He is not satisfied with your kindness to your neighbor because those things cannot take away the sins that we have committed. He is satisfied only with the travail of the soul of Jesus Christ. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied by his knowledge. By the knowledge of Jesus Christ shall my righteous servant justify many. The word justification means to declare righteous. That God, through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, is able now to take a sinner, an ungodly man, a Satanist, a transgender, uh, whatever you want to call yourself, is able to take that person who believes on Jesus Christ and justify that sinner. Justify means declare righteous. God will declare you righteous in his book of justice. Why? Because your sins have already been paid for in full. Remember when Jesus Christ was ready to die on the cross and he cried out, it is finished. Tetelestai or teleo in the Greek. Tetelestai is a Greek word. means paid in full. Paid in full, not 90% down payment. It means paid in full. And he bowed his head and he yielded up his spirit. He died. It is finished. It's done. And when Jesus Christ finished that, he finished all the work necessary to take sinners like you and me and to get us declared righteous before God in heaven. The Bible says that about Abraham in Romans chapter 4, uh, he just uh, Abraham was justified by faith, Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, and he believed the Lord and it was counted to him as righteousness. So when we believe this message that I'm preaching to you, when you receive it by faith and say, amen, that's the truth, man, that's it, I'm saved. Amen, you say amen to the message, that's it, that's the way it is, that's the truth. I don't need this religion, I don't need that. My sins are wiped away through Jesus Christ alone. When you have that epiphany of faith, God puts in his ledger book faith, and he counts that faith. He counts it as righteousness. He counts your faith as righteousness. Now, your church, you, you know, your, your religious system won't. Oh, there, there, sugar, that's, that's a nice little blessed start. But now you need to get busy in the church work. You need to get busy in the church work. I've noticed your tithes are down. Your tithes are down. You need to give a little bit more money for God to really, really, really accept you and to upgrade my pool. No, nope, it's free. God will justify the sinner through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and faith in him. Therefore, will I divide him a portion with the great and shall divide the spoil with the strong because, because he hath poured out his soul unto death and he was numbered with the transgressors and he bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressor. Now, you got to remember, that wasn't written after Jesus ascended to heaven. That was written 700 years before. So now we go fast forward. We're going to look at Paul. We've got five minutes. 1 Corinthians 15 is the gospel, the good news. That's what gospel means, good news. This isn't just, hey, I've got some decent news. I want to, Something might pick you up a little bit. No, no, no. This is good news. All right. Paul writes in chapter 15, verse 1 through 4. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, the good news, which I preached unto you, which also you've received, and wherein ye stand, by which, by the gospel, by the good news, by which also ye are saved. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you believed in vain, for I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. Number one, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. I just read it out of Isaiah to you. According to the scripture. Oh, by the way, Paul was a persecutor and murderer of Christians before his conversion. He was Saul of Tarsus, become Paul the apostle, had his head chopped off preaching this message. He used to kill people for this message. And then he got his head chopped off for preaching the same message. So he says, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Do you hear anything in that that says, oh, and by the way, you need to uh, uh, stop sinning and be better before you can get saved? 
You need to clean up your outside and the way you live. And no. It's all on Jesus Christ. Now, folks, I'm not I'm not trying to downplay, you know, uh, look, you know, if you're doing have destructive habits, it's it's wise counsel to stop doing that. Right. But I'll tell you this, as far as your salvation is concerned, when the father saw the travail of the soul of Jesus Christ, he was satisfied. God will give you the free gift of eternal life if you believe this gospel message, this good news that Christ died for your sins. It's all paid for. It's finished. That he was buried and he rose again the third day. And see, when he rose again the third day, he authenticated. He authenticated the truth that he is, in fact, the son of God. Because who, who else can raise himself from the dead? I mean, seriously, even if you don't believe the gospel, like I don't believe that, you must agree logically. If a man has the power to raise himself from the dead, you might want to pay attention to his teaching. You might be interested in what he has to say. You see, there's a lot of dead gurus. People go to the, the grave of their guru and put flowers on it and pray to a dead man in a tomb, in the grave, in the dirt, the worms are eating his flesh. But Jesus Christ was risen from the dead with eyewitnesses who gave their life for their testimony. You see, it's one thing to die for a lie that you think is true. It's an entirely different thing to die for a lie that you know is a lie. How come not one of those disciples, when they came and they all died except one, they tried to kill John and he survived supernaturally. They put him in boiling oil and he wouldn't die. So then they banished him to Patmos. And that's where God gave him the book of Revelation, the last days, the glory of Jesus Christ, the revelation of Christ. How come not one of those people said, okay, time out, time out, time out. I'll show you where the body is. It's a big hoax. They all went to their grave professing Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. Why didn't one of them cower out and say, here, I'll show you where the body is. Why not Peter? Peter denied him three times while he was still alive. But yet what happened to Peter? He died upside down, crucified in Rome. For this very message that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, he was died, crucified for our sins, buried and raised from the dead. And he wouldn't change his story. And they crucified him. He still wouldn't change it. Amen. Folks, this is authenticated with the blood of the martyrs and the testimony of Jesus Christ itself. I'm going to close here. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That's how you receive eternal life. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you shall be saved. Let's pray. Father, I'm thankful, God, for the opportunity to preach this word. I pray, Lord, I pray, God, that someone would believe and be saved. A spirit of mockery, a spirit of unbelief, Father, blinds the hearts and minds of, of the people. I just pray you bind that spirit. Lord, weigh heavy on the heart, Lord, that free gift is being offered. That the reality of the lake of fire and the torment, eternal torment of the lake of fire is real, Father, for those who die in their sins. Lord, let them know that their sins are completely wiped away in Jesus Christ and unbelieve and have eternal life. We thank you for the food provided for this place. And uh, for your grace, Lord, demonstrated in it. In Jesus' name.